We're now recording. Thank you again for attending the Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture. Today we'll be talking about invasive insects, impacts to agriculture. These are our regular Wednesday webinars. They happen the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at noontime. And we actually have them scheduled all the way through December. So you can log on to the link there in blue and you can see our upcoming webinars as well as previously recorded ones. We have over a hundred now listed on the website. So we're really excited about that. Before we get started, just a shout out to our sponsors of the Women in Agriculture program, as well as the number of collaborators that we have uh, here in the Mid-Atlantic. So with that, I am gonna turn over the presentation to Alan Leslie. He's in Southern Maryland, is an ag agent there. And in my eyes, definitely an expert on insects and entomology. So Alan, if you wanna start sharing your screen, we can get started. Sure. Any questions that you have, please use the chat pod for Alan and uh, I'll help manage that, Alan, as you go through your presentation today. Uh, excellent, okay. Thank you, Shannon, for that introduction and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak at this webinar series. Uh, so as Shannon mentioned, today I'll be talking about invasive insects and specifically uh, the impacts that they have in agriculture. Let's see. So the outline of what we're going to discuss today, uh, we'll talk uh, first of all about what invasive species are and offer a kind of definition for what makes a species invasive. And we're going to talk about how different species become invasive, why the crops we grow in particular are vulnerable to invasive insects, uh, the typical response that we have in dealing with new invasive species, and then finally touch on prospects of future invasions. So to start off with, um, we'll, we'll start with this simple definition of invasive species. There are many different definitions floating around, but this one uh, is, is one that's fairly useful because it includes a regulatory framework. So this is the definition that's offered by the USDA National Invasive Species Information Center, and it has two components. So first, the species has to be non-native or alien to the ecosystem under consideration, and two, uh, whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So any given species has to meet those two criteria in order to be defined as uh, invasive. So if we look at some other species that may fit some of that definition, so honeybees uh, are non-native to our ecosystem, so they're not native to North America, they're imported from Europe, but they, their introduction does not really cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Instead, they were brought over to, to pollinate crops and to improve uh, agriculture. So uh, under this definition, since it doesn't meet both criteria, the imported European honeybee would not be considered an invasive species. Likewise, this green peach aphid, uh, although they can uh, outbreak uh, and cause damage to uh, agricultural crops. Since it is a native aphid species, uh, it too would not be considered uh, an invasive insect under this definition. So not just any species can become an invasive species. There's you know, several steps that, that have to be overcome, several obstacles that have to be overcome before uh, any new species can become invasive in a new area. So the first is they have to overcome large scale geographic barriers. So remember the first part of that definition of an invasive species is that it is non-native or alien to the habitat under consideration. So for the most part, humans have been the ones facilitating these large scale geographic movements of insects and other species around the world. In particular, it's commerce. So we're moving large amounts of uh, goods, um, very far distances on a regular basis. And insects are very adept at hitchhiking along with those shipments. Second, these insects have to overcome survival barriers. So it's not just enough that you get moved a long distance, you have to end up in a habitat that will support you. So it has to have the right temperature, the right amount of moisture, 
um, the right shelter and the right food to support these uh, insects or these species in their new environment. Next, there are what are known as establishment barriers. So typically the founding populations of invasive species are going to be very small. And under these low densities of these small populations, it can often be difficult to find a mate and successfully reproduce. So even when species are introduced to a new suitable environment, a lot of times there's a lag period between when they get introduced and when their populations actually start to grow. And that's because uh, without a lot of individuals, it can be hard to find a mate and to successfully reproduce. Next, there are um, barriers. Uh, so, so next, you have to have some kind of dispersal and spread. So it's not just enough that you get introduced to a new area. Um, you have to start taking over that new area, start moving around um, to new territories. So often when there is a new invasive species, when we're talking about it, it's often useful to show maps like these, where the different colors represent different uh, areas occupied by that invader. And they typically take on this pattern where you have a central location where they're introduced for the first time, and then this radiating pattern outward as their populations grow and spread and invade new areas. So it's not just enough that you're invading one small area and you just stay there. Uh, in order to really become invasive, you have to start moving around and invading new territories. And finally, uh, these species have to cause some kind of harm uh, and have some kind of impact. So we saw from that initial definition, it can be economic, environmental, or human health related. Uh, but it has to have some kind of impact uh, that we as humans don't want. So even without the introduction of these new invasive species, there are plenty of problems that are already being caused uh, by our native insects. So this includes spread of diseases in humans, and a good example of that are mosquitoes, which are vectors of many different human diseases, including malaria, uh, yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, West Nile virus, Zika, and others. Also diseases in our livestock, the animals that are raising for food. There are a lot of native insects that are plenty good on their own of ravaging our crops and, and stored foods. And also damaging forests. So a good example of that are the native bark beetle species uh, that are decimating uh, pine trees. They're capable of destroying infrastructure. So termites are kind of the poster child of wood destroying insects, but there are several different uh, native species of insects that can attack wood and causing disruptive outbreaks. So especially in this area, uh, we have periodic emergences, large emergences of cicadas. Uh, so these 17-year cicadas, especially in brood X, which is the largest uh, cicada emergence that happens, at least in Maryland, and probably all of the mid-Atlantic, uh, emerged last in 2004. So you'll be excited to hear that next summer, uh, summer of 2021, we're, we're scheduled to have another mass emergence of these insects. So you can see exactly how disruptive these mass emergences can be. But all of these problems that I just described are actually all caused by native insects. Invasive insects can cause all of those problems and more. And there's been several attempts at trying to put dollar figures uh, on the, the damage caused by invasive insects. So some of the global estimates um, range about $70 billion a year. Now, this is just uh, damage caused by invasive insect species. This doesn't include other invasives like vertebrates, fish, um, or, or weeds. Uh, in the U.S., those estimates range between $27 and $40 billion per year. Um, and, and on a global basis, looking at uh, the most expensive invasive species to manage. Of the top four here, one of them, the diamondback moth, is an agricultural pest. So damage to agricultural crops uh, is 
is a major contributor of these dollar figures that we see. But it's pretty difficult to actually encapsulate the, the amount of damage that's caused on a global scale uh, by these different species. It's a little bit easier to try to quantify that on a case-by-case -case basis uh, between individual invasive species and specific commodities. So some examples of these, we have the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, just in 2010, when it was outbreaking in the mid-Atlantic area, it caused $37 million in damage to apple crops. And again, this is mainly in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, not even in some of the bigger apple producing areas of the country. Um, right here, the spotted lanternfly, which is a relatively recent, uh, recently introduced insect pest uh, in North America. Uh, it was introduced in Pennsylvania about five years ago. Uh, it's estimated that this insect pest causes $324 million um, a year just in Pennsylvania. And this is for efforts to control it, to eradicate it, um, dam or loss, loss to agricultural crops, and, and other expenses associated with the introduction. Uh, and then down here, this fly, this is spotted wing Drosophila. It attacks small fruit, so things like blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, anything with a really thin skin. Uh, and it's estimated that just in California, Oregon, and Washington, which produce a lot of small fruit, this insect caused over $500 million in damage in a single year. So there are huge uh, economic incentives for preventing new invasions of invasive insects because of the potential for them to cause uh, these levels of damage in, in our um, valuable uh, crops that we grow. So when a new species is introduced, so when a species is introduced to a new area, uh, it follows a typical pattern. So this pattern is called invasion curve, which describes the the biological process of the insect establishing itself, and also the kind of regulatory response uh, of the different agencies in the new country. So in this case, describing the typical process that happens when a new species is introduced to the United States. I'm gonna walk you through this graph, uh, but just keep in mind that this orange line here kind of represents the area that's being infested by the new species. Uh, so, of course, their populations start off small and then they grow larger. And then these green lines represent the relative cost um, that it would take to control the new insect at each of these different stages that we'll describe. So, we'll start here at the first step. This is when a new or potentially new invasive species is absent. So, they're not present in the United States. Uh, they're present in other countries. They could potentially move here, uh, but they're not here yet. So you see there's no orange line. They have no, uh, they oc don't occupy any territory within the United States. Uh, and the expense for keeping them out and preventing their invasion is relatively low. And so the main organization in charge of preventing new invasions is uh, USDA's APHIS program. So they're charged with inspecting and certifying imports, and mainly protecting the ports of entry of the country from inadvertently bringing in any new potential invasive insects. So if a new species does arrive, so if a new invasive, potentially invasive species is found outside of the ports, outside of the shipments, somewhere else in the country, then things get more difficult. So typically, again, the management decisions are made at the federal level. So USDA will uh, collaborate with other federal agencies through uh, the National Invasive Species Information Center uh, to try to identify the pest, so positively ID it as something that's not native uh, to the United States, put in emergency management protocols for detecting the populations and trying to eradicate it while it's still only occupying a very small area. So you may have heard in the news of uh, murder hornets or the uh, giant Asian hornets that are found in the Pacific Northwest. 
At this point, this is kind of the stage they're at. So they've been detected in the United States outside of the ports of entry, but their populations are relatively isolated. And at this point, they're focusing on trying to locate them and eradicate them while they're still only occupying a small area. If, however, those early eradication efforts don't work and the pest becomes well established in its area and begins to spread, the effort shifts from eradication to slowing the spread and containing the pest within quarantine areas. So in this case, they typically um, bring in state departments of agriculture to help to establish and enforce quarantines to limit the movement of different insect species. Uh, the EPA will also get involved uh, as the insects are spreading. Uh, it'll be important to bring uh, or get different insecticides registered to be able to control those insect pests and to further limit the spread. And again, the costs go up because now we're dealing with a much larger area. Um, and so our enforcement, our, our efforts to um, limit the spread are happening over a much wider area. And many more people are going to be involved. And then finally, the last stage is when an invasive species becomes pervasive. So it's spread as far as it'll spread. It's occupied this entire new, uh, new habitat or new area in its introduced space. And there's no chance of quarantining it further or eradicating it in its introduced area. So this is kind of where we are with brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, we did spend a lot of time trying to quarantine and limit the spread of that insect in its introduced area, but it has spread pretty far within the United States at this point. And at this point, the focus is less on limiting the spread and limiting movement and more on how we can adapt our management strategies, how we can adapt farming and other practices uh, to deal with this pest because it's here, for, here to stay and it's just a part of life from now on. And at this point, the control costs go up uh, pretty much as high as they can go because again, it's occupying the widest area possible. And a lot of the efforts here are going into research to, uh, to find strategies to help manage uh, this new pest. And a lot of that research is done by graduate students. And graduate students are really expensive. You gotta feed them and clothe them. And uh, they're just, they're very needy. So that's part of the reason why those control costs go uh, way through the roof now here at this final stage. So it would be nice to be able to profile in base, our different species uh, to be able to predict whether they would be invasive if they're introduced to a new area. And so although we don't have an exact profile of what makes a species invasive, there are some characteristics of invasive species that tend to show up uh, more often. So these characteristics include multiple generations per year. So being able to re reproduce multiple times in a single growing season can really help to overcome those establishment barriers. Uh, it can help your populations to build up quickly and then potentially move and occupy further, further territories. So a good example of that, an insect, invasive insect species with multiple generations per year is that spotted wing Drosophila. So at 25 degrees Celsius, which is you know, just a little bit warmer than room temperature. It's probably about 75, 76 degrees Fahrenheit. One generation only takes eight to 10 days uh, to complete fully from egg to adult. So in the middle of the growing season, um, when it's very easy to see these temperatures, you can have a dozen or more generations of this insect in a single year. So this allows their populations to easily explode if introduced to a new area. Another characteristic of invasive species is having a wide host range. So this helps to make sure that if you are introduced to a new area, there's going to be food there, there's going to be some resource that you can exploit and that you can uh, use as, as food. So probably the poster child for having a wide host range is that brown marmorated stink bug. It'll feed on pretty much anything that produces fruit. So all of our tree fruit, small fruit, vegetable crops, field crops. It'll even feed on wheat, corn, and soybeans. 
And they've even been seen feeding on ornamental trees. I guess if they get really desperate, they just feed directly on the, the tree sap. Next is a wide uh, temperature range. So uh, again, this goes into being adaptable to being introduced to a new environment. Uh, so if, you, if, if it doesn't matter, if you can handle uh, extremes of high and low temperature, then it's more likely that if you're introduced to a new area, you'll be able to survive there. So one example of that is the kudzu bug. So uh, kudzu bug is pictured down here on the bottom right. This map, the shaded area is showing the area that this insect uh, has occupied since being introduced to Georgia. And these lines uh, represent the temperature extremes that this insect can survive in uh, in the lab. So there's a graduate student again who did a bunch of experiments seeing what are the extremes of temperature that this species can survive. And you can see plotted on this uh, map as the typical extreme lows during winter, uh, their new population in the United States seems to be roughly limited by the extreme cold temperatures that they experience during winter months. So if this insect were capable of surviving lower temperatures, uh, it may have been able to spread further throughout the country. But in this case, because it has a somewhat limited temperature range, its area within its new introduced um, country within the US uh, is limited. Next is asexual reproduction. So insects are extremely diverse and have many diverse ways of reproducing. And many insects essentially don't need a male and a female. And the best example of that uh, are aphids. So in many aphid species, female aphids can just lay eggs without being fertilized. And those eggs will um, develop fully into other females. And then those females can also produce offspring without having males in them. So essentially, you double your reproductive output because you don't have those wasteful males around that can't have offspring on their own. So an example of that is the sugarcane aphid here on the right. Uh, it's feeding on a sorghum leaf. Uh, it only takes one female to be able to produce uh, an exploding population of aphids like you see on this leaf. So again, this is a strategy that can help overcome uh, those early reproductive barriers or the problems of having a very small founding population. If it only takes a single individual to reproduce and, um, and reproduce relatively quickly, then you're more likely to be successful and, and to produce uh, a new population in an introduced area. So why is it that native insects aren't a problem with native plants? You know, if insects are capable of all of these incredible things, why, why don't our native insects just completely wipe out the plants um, that are in the, in the same habitat? So as an example, we have here uh, a native plant species. Uh, it could be any plant species, really. And as a native plant, it's got uh, a host of native herbivores that normally will feed on it. And typically, in, ha in native habitats, They've been living together uh, for tens of thousands or even millions of years. So they've had a lot of time uh, to adapt to one another. So this plant gets fed on by the same insect or the same group of insect species every year and knows what to expect. And there's been co-evolution between the two to make sure that they don't end up destroying one another. So some of those adaptations may be kind of physical structures. So plants may evolve spines, hairs. Uh, they may evolve a thicker, tougher leaf structure um, or, or any other mechanical strategies to keep those insects from successfully feeding uh, on their tissues. They may also defend themselves by producing different uh, chemicals that are toxic to the insects. 
So some examples of chemicals that plants can produce that are toxic to insects include nicotine, pyrethrin, and tannic acid in oak leaves. They're all, they all are either uh, acutely toxic to insects or um, make it extremely difficult for the insect to digest that leaf tissue. So in other words, protecting their, their leaves through chemical means. Or uh, they may be able to adapt their life history strategies. So they can change uh, when they grow, they can adapt uh, when their flowers or fruit or other um, sensitive structures appear so that they're just not around while those different insect species are feeding. In addition to that, uh, there's other players in this native habitat, including native predators that are well adapted to feeding on that, those insect species. So they help to keep their populations down. And there's typically a whole suite of diseases. Uh, so fungal pathogens, bacteria, and viruses that will attack these insect species to further limit their population growth and to keep them from exploding and completely decimating the native plants. One group in particular that is very efficient at limiting the population growth of some of these herbivorous insects are a group of insects called parasitoids. So parasitoids are uh, a unique group in that their entire larval development, so they, they, they completely develop uh, on a host insect, uh, and then they end up killing that host insect before they complete their development. So one example of that that you may have seen is this uh, tobacco hornworm caterpillar. All of these fuzzy white cocoon-like structures here on the back are the pupae of a parasitic wasp. So right here is the parasitoid wasp. It lays multiple eggs in these caterpillars. Eggs hatch inside the caterpillar. The larvae develop feeding on the inside of the caterpillar. And when the larvae have completed their development, they chew their way out of the caterpillar, they pupate and become wasps. So they completely develop on their host and they end up killing it. Another example, so they'll, these parasitoids can attack any life stage. They can attack the larval stage, they can attack adult stages, nymphs. Um, and a cool one are these that attack eggs. So on the right here, this is an egg mass of an herbivorous stink bug, so brown stink bug egg mass. But they've all been parasitized by a wasp. So now instead of having little stink bugs hatch and feed on the plant, you'll have little wasps hatching out of these eggs. And they'll continue the cycle and find more stink bug egg masses and parasitize those. So invasive insects are able to decimate uh, plants in their introduced ranges because they're able to circumvent a lot of these controls that are typically in place, uh, limiting the population growth of, of native insects. So examples of that are that invasive insects may come with a tolerance to the chemistries that, that plants already have to defend themselves. Uh, they may already, they may attack plants in new ways so the plants in the introduced range, they, they may not be physically defended against some types of feeding. So this includes things like stem boring insects or leaf mining insects, um, or just insects that feed in ways that, that the plant isn't used to because there's no native insects that feed in that way. And they may have faster growth rates than the native insects. So all of that can help these invasive insect species um, to increase the feeding damage that they're capable of doing. In addition, in their introduced ranges, predators may not recognize the in invasive insects as prey items, so they may not uh, know to attack them. Uh, they may avoid predator habitats. They may occupy parts of the plant where they're protected from predators. And they may not be susceptible to the native uh, pathogens that would normally affect native insect species. So as a result, they, they tend to have higher survivorship and then their populations can outbreak. So they're essentially circumventing controls from the plant and from the environment to be able to outbreak and cause more damage. 
So one useful way of looking at uh, survivorship and mortality in, in different species is through survivorship curves. So this graph is showing the age on the x-axis here, so from left to right is younger to older, and on the y-axis is the percent surviving. So we always start at 100 percent of the population. This just shows um, where mortality happens uh, and as far as age is concerned. So as an example, we'll start with humans. So humans tend to have relatively low mortality throughout most of our lives, owing to our excellent child care, our antibiotics, um, all of our, the safety measures that we have in place to limit human deaths until we reach kind of an extreme age and then we all kind of kick off. You can compare that to birds, on the other hand, which tend to have uh, kind of an even chance or probability of death at, at any stage throughout their, their life cycle. So from the nest to adulthood, there's pretty much an even probability um, of dying. Most insect species follow a curve like this, where there's huge mortality at the egg stage or the early nymph or the larval stage, so these younger stages, and then only a few individuals survive uh, to reproduce and add to the, the following generation. And so by circumventing this early, especially if you're circumventing this early mortality with invasive species, then you can end up with a much larger population later on contributing to that next generation. And this is the way that invasive insect species um, can, can outbreak in huge numbers. In addition, agriculture in general is somewhat primed for invasion. So farms tend to be simplified environments with highly reduced structure and lower plant diversity. Uh, monoculture plantings make it very easy for herbivorous insects to find their host plant because it's the only thing that's there. They don't have to go searching uh, among other non-host plants to be able to find a plant that can support them. And in general, there tends to be a lack of biological control. So there's lower diversity and lower abundance of the predators and parasitoids that would typically attack uh, pest species. And there's been uh, many different studies that have tried to quantify this. And in general, you see um, a decline in pest control, natural pest control, predators and parasitoids under more intensive agricultural uh, habitats. So in this, this graph is showing on the x-axis the proportion of cultivated land. So the proportion of the land that is in farming uh, within a one kilometer radius. And on the, the y-axis here is the mean level of natural pest control. And of course, this graph is very messy, but in general, you get a decline in the amount of natural pest control. So the amount of mortality that you're getting from those predators and other beneficial insects, uh, the more land that you have in, in farming. In addition, um, the crops that we grow tend to be very poorly defended on their own. So we've done a lot of uh, selection in our crops to make sure that they are delicious. Not, we haven't really done a lot of selection in our crops to make sure that they are physically and chemically defended against each other. So we've selected for things like tender, delicious leaves and large, delicious fruits. And in many cases, by doing this, there's a trade-off with natural defenses within those plants. So you may lose defensive uh, chemistries, uh, you may lose toughness, but in general, that's what we're after. We don't want to eat poisons and we don't want to eat really hard, tough leaves. And so a good example of that uh, on the left here is essentially a wild cabbage. Um, and on the right is the uh, cultivated uh, variety of cabbage that we that we grow, I would much rather eat this delicious tender cabbage on the right than this tough stringy weed <laughs> over here on the left. And the same goes for many insects. 
So in, in general, insects would find uh, the cultivated cabbage much more palatable than uh, the wild strains. And so as a result, crop plants are extra vulnerable to herbivory, not just from invasive insects, but also from our native insects, because in general, we're removing or selecting against a lot of those defenses. So there's different strategies uh, that you can take to try to replace some of that uh, natural pest control that's lost under uh, most typical monoculture farming practices. So some of the research that I've been involved in has looked at uh, increasing crop diversification or increasing plant diversification uh, within vegetable crop plantings uh, to try to promote some of those natural enemies, to try to bring in more of the predators and more of the parasitoids. So some of these strategies include uh, adding either living or dead cover crop between plant rows to increase the structural diversity and increase the amount of habitats for those predators and parasitoids. Increasing the crop diversity by interplanting different crop species to try to get some of those predators to move between crops and potentially control pests uh, between different crop species. And then adding uh, flower resources as borders to crop fields. So especially those parasitoids, and they're, although the, the larval stages develop on the pest insects, uh, the adult stages, many of them require some kind of nectar uh, to stay alive. Uh, and so if, the idea is that if you provide some flowers within the uh, cropping system, then we can potentially keep those parasitoids alive longer and they can parasitize more of your pest insects. And so one example of that kind of work that was done um, to try to manipulate habitats to, to provide better uh, control of brown marmorated stink bug uh, was this experiment where they planted a flowering strip of partridge pea adjacent to uh, plots of organic field corn. And then compare that to uh, just monoculture stands of field corn without the flowering resources next to them. So partridge pea was chosen because in addition to having a lot of flowers, it produces what are called extra floral nectaries. So these are just structures on the plant that secrete nectar and it's not tucked away in a flower. So that means those very, very small parasitoids, which sometimes have a hard time getting into uh, complicated flowers, have easy access to that nectar resource. And the results of this study showed an increase in uh, predator abundance of generalist predators that could attack brown marmorated stink bugs, like spiders and assassin bugs, and an increase in parasitism rates. So this kind of strategy where you're just taking the native beneficial insects and manipulating the habitat to increase their abundance to try to get some biological control uh, is tends to be uh, called conservation biological control. So you're conserving the natural enemies that are already present in the environment and manipulating it in a way that benefits you by, by increasing the amount of predation of your pest insects. You can compare that to another strategy called classical biological control. Now this is where when you have an invasive, an invasive species in a new habitat and there's no predators, there's no parasitoids attacking it in that new habitat, you go back to the pest's native range, find out what species attack it there, and then bring those along uh, to its new introduced range so that they can keep uh, fighting them or keep eating them in their new introduced range. So the main difficulty with this is that you really want to make sure that if you are introducing a predator or a parasitoid species, that it's not going to start attacking your native species and become a pest all on its own. So before these introductions can be made, it takes years to screen uh, potential biological control agents to make sure that under no circumstances they will attack any non-target pests. So on this slide, the top three insects are examples of invasive insects that have been introduced 
relatively recently to the United States, brown marmorated stink bug, kudzu bug, and spotted lanternfly. Brown marmorated stink bug and kudzu bug both had uh, their own species of egg parasitoids being screened by USDA for potential release to control those pest insects. So for brown marmorated stink bug, it was Trisulcus duponicus, and for kudzu bug, it was Paratelonomus saccharalis. And while they were both under screening, these species were found uh, basically in the wild. So they got, they got introduced to the country in some other way. Um, apparently, they did the genetic testing to make sure that it wasn't an accidental release from the USDA facilities, and USDA confirmed that it was not their fault. But either way, these species made it to the United States on their own. The USDA did continue with the release program for Trisulcus duponicus, though. Um, so they're doing a lot of work to see if it is having an impact on, uh, on the pet species in its new range. On the right-hand side here, the spotted lanternfly. Uh, this parasitoid species, Anastatus orientalis, it was not released to control spotted lanternfly. It was released years ago to control gypsy moth. And it turns out this species apparently also happens to attack the eggs of spotted lanternfly. So this is kind of a fortuitous bonus um, that really no one was expecting. But I think partly because they lay eggs in a similar fashion to gypsy moth, it just happens to be in the right habitat to be attacked by this, this insect species. In addition, uh, pathogens, in many cases, will also eventually find their invasive hosts. So even though invasive species may not at first be susceptible to pathogens in their new environments, um, it usually doesn't take too long for those pathogens to adapt to attacking those insects. So on the left, this is a kudzu bug, and you can see the fuzziness around the legs and the head. Uh, are the spore-relating structures of Bovaria bassiana, which is a generalist uh, fungal pathogen that attacks many different insects. And then this is a brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, it doesn't produce these cool fruiting bodies, but it's being attacked by Nosema madoxi, which is a microsporidian. Um, so at the time that kudzu bug was found to be attacked by this fungal species, their populations kind of crashed in the south, and there hasn't been any really economically damaging outbreaks since then. With stink bugs, uh, it varies. So some populations have high loads of this pathogen, and some don't, but it doesn't seem to be completely wiping out uh, stink bugs in its new range. But when these biological controls don't work, of course, uh, the other method that you can use is uh, insecticides or chemical pesticides. However, there are a few different problems that you have to overcome. Whenever we have new invasive species, you can't just go to the shelf and grab any old pesticide and start spraying. Uh, because the use of insecticides is controlled uh, by a lot of laws, mainly to protect, protect human health uh, and the environment. Uh, we have to be aware of, of these laws and regulations whenever new insects are introduced to, to the country. So whenever new in, insects are introduced, automatically there, there won't be pesticides registered for them because no companies would go through the process of registering a pesticide for a pest that doesn't exist in the country. So new registrations have to happen before you can start applying those insecticides. Now, the simplest case is if you already have an insecticide labeled for a crop, but it's just not labeled for that use on that pest. In that case, you can get a Section 2EE recommendation uh, that essentially expands the current registration to include a new target species. And this is the easiest to achieve. This is a very straightforward thing that pesticide companies can do because you already have all of the uh, residue tests that are related to human health and safety 
you're not changing application rates, you're not changing any of the other components of the label, uh, you're only changing what target species that you can, you can try to control with the, with the pesticide. So an example of that um, is there's a two EE recommendation for using malathion on these different tree fruit to control this new pest, the spotted lanternfly. So malathion was already labeled for use in these crops. It's just now adding this additional pest target species. Um, it gets more difficult though, if the pest is attacking other crop species and there are no effective pesticides registered for that crop. So in those cases, you can um, get different registration, get pesticides uh, registered in different ways. One is through a section 18 emergency exemption. So these are very temporary exemptions uh, and they happen within a growing season and they, they're, they're very temporary. They only last uh, at most a couple of months. So in Maryland, at least, all of the Section 18 exemptions that have been issued uh, lately have been for brown marmorated stink bug control. So you can see here on the left of this table are the chemicals. So dinatopuran and bifenthrin are the two that are listed in this, in this list. These are the crops. So bifenthrin was not labeled for these crops, but it's needed to control brown marmorated stink bug. And without it, essentially anyone growing these crops would lose their entire crop during the season. So it's really this kind of Section 18 exemption is meant as a response to a current outbreak that there's currently no other way of controlling the pest. So it's not a long-term solution. Another example is the Section 24 registration or the special local need. So these are, again, temporary registrations, but they last longer than a couple of months. And they tend to be for when an invasive species is present in a new environment and it's a perennial pest. So we know that it's coming back every year. Um, and we know that we need a, a new chemical uh, for that particular crop. So an example of that, you know, malathion has a uh, Section 24C registration to control uh, spotted wing drosophila in blueberries in Pennsylvania. So malathion was not labeled for use in blueberries until this pest came along. It's one of the only things that can be used to control it. Um, it's needed because the pest is going to continue to be around. But these registrations, again, are not permanent and typically only um, are only good for a couple of years. The only way to get a more permanent solution is through the typical Section 3 registration. But these tend to be lengthy and expensive. And if you're dealing with low value crops, there's not a lot of incentive for pesticide companies to go through uh, the trouble of all of the research and documentation that you need to, to show the human health and safety aspects uh, to meet that Section 3 registration. So in response to that, uh, the IR4 project uh, has been working to help to register different pesticides for specialty crops. So this is a program that was established in 1963 and administered by USDA ARS, and it provides financial assistance for uh, universities and other groups to produce the um, lab work to do the safety uh, assays and everything to show that these pesticides can be safely used on specialty crops um, so that they can get the registration, these per more permanent Section 3 registrations, which last 10 years before they have to be reviewed. Uh, and these are especially useful in cases where the um, pesticide companies aren't going to make any money by expanding the registration to these minor crops, but the people in these areas growing them depend on having uh, adequate pest control. So invasive insects are going to continue to threaten the United States and, you know, other countries. Um, what this map is showing in uh, with the different colors here 
represents invasion uh, risk, essentially, of these different countries. So what this analysis did was that they uh, developed these map values based on the crops that are grown in the different countries and the invasive or potentially invasive species that are present in the countries that they trade with. So if we take the United States, for example, the United States grows a lot of different crops and a lot of different high value crops. And we also do a lot of commerce with a lot of countries around the world. So we're, our potential for importing different species is very high if we're bringing in goods from around the world. And because we have so many different crops that they can attack, uh, the potential for any given invasive species to become uh, an economic pest is relatively high compared to many other countries. So essentially what this graph is showing is that we're at high risk <laughs> for, um, for new introductions to, to become a problem and to, to do damage to agricultural crops and, and essentially um, produce economic damage. Uh, in addition, it's only going to get worse. So what this graph is showing is the correlation between insect pests that have been introduced to the United States and uh, the value of goods that have been imported into the country. Uh, so essentially, uh, like we touched on some of the earlier slides, invasive insects get moved around the country primarily through global trade, so the movement of goods among countries. Uh, and this graph, of course, is, is showing a relatively large time scale between 1800 and year 2010. Uh, so that's why it looks like this kind of exponential growth right here at the end, where uh, technology has really facilitated, you know, large, large scale, long distance movement of a lot of, of goods across the world. And the pests that have been introduced roughly follow that because, again, they're hitchhiking along with the goods as they're being moved across, uh, across the world. And this is going to continue. It's not like we're going to stop importing goods from other countries. Uh, global trade is going to, going to continue, and these insect pest introductions are going to continue to, to follow along. So uh, the kind of pressure or, or uh, potential new introductions is always going to be there. And so it would be nice to be able to predict what the next big insect pest would be. And of course, APHIS has a kind of list of problematic insects that they're on the lookout for, the things that they definitely are screening for at ports of entry that they don't want uh, to let into the country. But in some regards, it's really unpredictable. So it's, it's like an experiment every time a new species is introduced to a new environment. Uh, it's really impossible to completely predict how they're going to react to the new environment, um, how their populations are going to grow, and what, what new crops they can potentially attack uh, if they're introduced to a brand new environment. Um, so it would be nice to be able to compile these lists of insect species that we definitely don't want to have introduced to the country or things that we need to be on the lookout for. Uh, but in some some sense, it's, it's impossible to tell, and uh, new invasive species could potentially come out of nowhere. Because many, many of the invasive species that have become big problems in the United States are not major pest uh, species in their native ranges. So in a sense, it's like rolling a dice. Um, and, and, and it's impossible to tell. The only thing that we can be sure of is that there will be more invasive species in the future, they'll have more impact on agriculture, and there's going to be a continued need for um, scouting and, and learning about how to respond and adapt our management practices in dealing with these new pests. And so that's all I've got for you guys today. Um, stop sharing.
Alan, we've got a number of requests or, or questions. Um, so I'll go ahead back through the chat here and uh, shout those out to you. Let's see. Um, so uh, in your first couple of slides, uh, you had some pictures and photos of insects. Um, what were the black and white ones to the left? It's on your intro slide here. So uh, these right here, these are the adults of the spotted uh, lanternfly. So this is the one that's been introduced to Pennsylvania uh, in 2014. It's been found in Maryland. Uh, so reproducing populations were found in two counties in Maryland last summer. Uh, and they, they've been found again this year. So nymphs have been hatching from egg masses um, in the two, two counties that border with Pennsylvania. So this is one that Maryland is currently trying to limit the spread of through uh, quarantine practices through screening and limiting uh, movement of objects where they might be uh, clinging onto or hitchhiking on, uh, but it's only a matter of time before it spreads throughout the state. There's no there's no chance of eradicating it at this point. All right, and I'll just remind everyone if they do have questions, please feel free. I mean, this is the time to type those into the chat pod for Alan. Um, so the next question is. The Africanized bees, um, they meet both of the criteria for invasive insects, is that correct? Uh, yeah, so uh, Africanized bees, or the so-called killer bees, uh, they, since they are more aggressive and they do pose a, a real threat to, to human health because of their aggressive nature, uh, they do meet that definition. And so, you know, part of that, the utility of that definition is for developing policy for dealing with different uh, different insect species. So since it meets the criteria of being an invasive species under that definition, um, then you can start drafting policies to help control those populations and limit it to you know the, the aggressive uh, bees uh, and differentiate those from you know the European strains that were bred to be more docile around humans and less aggressive with their handlers. Great, great. So there's another question about what flowers were planted to suppress the brown marmorated stink bug next to the corn. So that was a uh, partridge pea. So it's a it's a native wildflower. Um, that was there. You know, prior prior to that experiment, um, there were several other experiments that had screened a few different wildflowers for their potential use in the field. And that one was chosen because. Um, it flowers for a very long period of time. It produces those extra floral nectaries. So the nectar resource uh, was thought to, to, to be present throughout the entire growing season. And it forms a very dense stand. So it's, it's a little slow to germinate. So you do need to do a little bit of weeding to make sure it gets established. Uh, but once, once it does establish itself, there's really no other maintenance required. So, um, I mean, you saw how, how thick that sand was in the one picture. Uh, it essentially forms like a little miniature hedge next to the, the uh, corn plants. Okay. Uh, another question, can you tell us which of our natives have become notably invasive in other countries? Which of our native species have been, uh, have become invasive in other countries? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. So one in particular, the fall, fall armyworm, which is a, a native pest of corn in North America, um, has been introduced to different African countries. Uh, it's been decimating corn um, in some countries there. Now, I'm, I'm less familiar with kind of the reverse. <laughs> that have been introduced in other areas, but it, I mean, I believe we have introduced, you know, as many as we have brought in. So, um, right, right. Although APHIS is also uh, one of their uh, jobs is also to screen exports to make sure that we're not um, inadvertently introducing things to other areas where we shouldn't be. Okay. Another question is, where would you put the efforts to bring natural enemies, and who pays? 
So I don't know if that's when you were talking about some of the funding. Um, so it depends. Um, if you're trying to do the kind of conservation biological control where you're just trying to make the cropping system more hospitable to natural predators and parasitoids and augment the amount of biological control that you naturally get from the environment. Uh, there's programs through NRCS that include uh, the conservation reserve, conservation reserve enhancement programs that will pay for planting flowering buffer strips. And so some other work that, that I was involved in looked at uh, whether or not including flowering plants in these buffer strips, which are planted for essentially sediment and erosion control, um, can enhance uh, biological control in cornfields. And you do get more of the parasitoids, more of the beneficial insects spilling over from those buffer strips into the crop field. Uh, so that there are funding opportunities for uh, habitat improvement. Uh, as far as the, the uh, high school biological control, uh, <laughs> my understanding is it's, it's essentially the USDA that, that puts the bill for bringing in, finding, bringing in, and screening um, different potential biological control agents from other countries. And once they are, once they, they have identified one that they can use in, in, in the new range, uh, sometimes they'll have programs where they just make those biological control agents available for free. So one example of that is the uh, emerald ash borer, which attacks the invasive beetle that attacks ash trees. Uh, there are three different parasitoid species that they've brought in. Um, and my understanding is USD, well, MDA through USDA will make these species available uh, to anyone who's got ash trees on their property to be able to release to, to potentially protect them. Shannon, were there any more questions? Sorry, I was muted. Um, there yeah. is. So it was, um, uh, wouldn't the kudzu bug be able to catch rides from cars and trucks that spread from Georgia to California? Uh, yes, potentially. Um, potentially, they could. They could catch rides between Georgia and California. Uh, so, I'm since the you know the original introduction happened in Georgia. Uh, I'm a little less familiar with what happened in that state around the time it was introduced. I don't know if they had in place any kind of um, quarantine measures to to try to make sure that if people were traveling from the areas where they were introduced to other areas of the country uh, to make sure they weren't, you know, accidentally transporting them. Uh, but, you know, there are some, just inherently some insects that have behaviors that lend themselves to being hitch better hitchhikers than others. And I don't think kudzu bugs fit that bill. Uh, so for example, that spotted lanternfly, they will lay their eggs typically on trees, but they'll also just kind of lay them on anything around. So one of the fears with uh, spotted lanternfly is that if you've got an old truck sitting at the corner of your yard that you only drive, you know, every once in a while, and 
it just happens to get some eggs laid on it, and then you then you drive out to California, that you could move at very long distances. Um, the kudzu bug A doesn't have any doesn't really have any behavior similar to that, where it would be it would you know, seek shelter in a, in a truck or something like that. Um, or lay its eggs on on something that would be moved. And the other thing is, it's it's a pretty strong flyer. So, uh, it I mean, you saw the the distances that it had moved from that map. Um, it's it's pretty good at, at moving itself on its own. So, uh, I don't think they were as concerned with with those. I guess those kinds of inspections in quarantine. But so far, I don't I don't think it's been moved to California. So. Um, I don't know how many people have, have driven from Georgia to California since then, but I'm sure it's not zero. All right. Um, there's another question. In the Master Gardener program, we often tell people that pesticides aren't effective on this pest. What insect behaviors or habits make it such that using insecticides isn't effective? Is it all related to the fact that some pests don't exist in infestation? Uh, that's, well, that's a seems like a so I, I it's more of an question. effectiveness of certain pesticides. So there's, I mean, there's many reasons why you know pesticides won't work on a, on a, any given pest. Um, so there's there's very few insecticides that are you know truly broad spectrum and that will kill all, all insects. I don't I actually there's probably none that exists that will kill all insects. So there's always the chance that uh, the insect species is naturally tolerant of whatever that chemistry is. Um, there's also a lot different life stages. So within certain certain insecticides, they may only be effective against the larval or the nymph stages. They may not be effective at all against the adult stages. Um, and then there's behavioral aspects of of the insects. So some of them, um, may be more cryptic than others. So you may get feeding damage um, by the insects, but they may uh, hide in certain parts of the plant where you, it's difficult to get good spray covered by different insecticides, or they may uh, drop off of the plant and hide you know, in the soil or in, in whatever mulch is around the base of the plant. Um, and then that way, just kind of essentially dodge the sprays. So it's, a, it's kind of a complicated question about knowing why certain insecticides wouldn't, wouldn't work to control different species. We also have, um, I think this is the last question I have, is uh, how easy is it to register European pesticides for use here? How easy is it to register European pesticides for use here? Um, it's, it, I mean, it's the same as any other pesticide. It's the same, same exact process. It doesn't really matter which, in which countries they were developed. Uh, all that matters is, you know, what the chemistry is, and whether or not there's a, they've gone through the registration process in the United States. I don't think that EPA recognizes any of the, the basically any of the registration information from other countries, they would basically have to start over and do everything again um, in the USA according to EPA guidelines. All right, there's another question about um, the effective use of fungal pathogens in controlling invasive insects. Well, that's a good question. So there, there are, um, there are a few different fungal pathogens that are essentially listed as bioinsecticides. And in fact, that one example that I gave of uh, that species, Bovaria bassiana, attacking uh, the kudzu bug, that is one fungal species that you can actually buy as a bioinsecticide. So they are very effective sometimes. The problem with fungal pathogens or bioinsecticides is that you need the right environment for that fungal pathogen to survive. So they have their own requirements for temperature and humidity and moisture. Well, I guess humidity and moisture are the same, but 
um, for, for them to, to be biologically active and to attack your target pest. So if, if conditions are right for that fungal pathogen to, to reproduce, um, then you can get excellent control. But if you spray it on a really hot, really dry day or really cold day or under, under other conditions that uh, are not conducive to that fungal pathogen, then it, you just won't get, won't get very good control, no matter what you're, you're spraying it against. Um, but, um, you know, many of them will, will work against, um, many of them will work against species, whether or not they're native or, or introduced. It's just that they all, you know, they, they have their limitations uh, as well about what, what species that they'll control. Yeah, they included example, the metatarsium acidurum. <laughs> Metarizium. Yeah, met metarizium is another one that's um, that that is widely used as a um, bioinsecticide. But just like the bovaria, it you know the different fungal species they work better on some insect species than others. So they're not they're definitely not broad spectrum um, as far as what species they control. And again, you have that environmental component too. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question, question that popped up in mind as uh, mm -hmm. does selective breeding of crops affect its evolution against native pests? Um, I would say yes. So um, the selective breeding of crops that you know results in, in bigger, better fruit and, and tastier uh, food generally leaves it less defended against invasive pests and, and native pests as well. Very good. Any other uh, any other questions for Alan? At this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. If if there's still questions coming in, go ahead.